Okay, verse number one, the Bible reads like this. It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Jesus was tempted by who? Good job. It says, After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Some of you are like, I've been hungry for the last 40 minutes. Come on, right? Verse three, it says, Then the tempter came to him, Jesus, and he said this. This is the first temptation. Pay close attention. He said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus replied to that statement. And he said, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of who? God. That's the first temptation. Watch the second one here. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. I told you this a couple weeks ago. It's important that we understand this. The devil is quoting scripture. Okay. Satan knows scripture. The question we got to ask ourselves is, does the devil know scripture more than I do? Mercy. Come on, somebody. All right. Because he will twist it. Verse 7. Jesus answered him. The devil was like, it is written. Jesus like, oh yeah, well, it is also written. Come on, somebody. Do not put the Lord God to the test. Again, the devil took him. That was the second. Here's the third temptation. Again, the Lord God took the, I'm sorry, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, all this I will give you. He said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him him only then the devil left him and angels came and they did what attended jesus or they ministered and encouraged and blessed jesus i want to talk to you today from the first temptation that jesus was tempted all right turning stones into bread it was more than just bread someone say it was more than bread okay it wasn't just about bread pan dulce it was more than bread it was at stake and i want to talk to you about that this morning i've entitled this message what do i live on what do I live on? Let's pray. Bow your head. Father, we thank you. We've prayed this morning. We've worshiped. Beautiful worship before you, God. We've lifted our hands, our voices, but more importantly, we lifted our hearts. And God, I just pray that you fill this room right now with your sweet presence, your sweet anointing, God. That, Father, anyone who's in this room battling temptation would overcome it by the power that you give us. I pray that we would use your word, that we would use, Father, all that you have for us. I pray that you would encourage us. And God, if anyone's in this room who is maybe being conquered with a habit or something that's hurting them, that today would be their day of freedom. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. The people of God say amen. amen. Give God a loud clap. Come on, third service. Hallelujah. <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Right on. Someone say temptation. Amen. Well. This uh, holiday weekend, as we're celebrating 4th of July, I believe that you being here, just sitting here right now, and, re and resisting the temptation to just say, I'm going to sleep in on 4th of July weekend, but I'm going to go to the house of God and hear a message and be encouraged, is already setting you up to live with the spirit of freedom. The Bible says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, and you are in a good place. Give God one clap, because we love to clap in church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, uh, AV, can we make sure the AC is on? Press that button. Make sure that it's on. I don't know. I feel like I w it, it turned off or something, or maybe it's just me. Maybe these lights are getting me hot. Maybe this hat's making me hot. I don't know. I never preach with a hat. It's the first time I preach with a hat. But I'm doing this for the Peru missions. Dunk me after if you want to support missions. Sorry. Okay. Temptation. You ready? Okay, get your pins out, get your notepads out. If you're not taking notes, I want you to write this down. If you are taking notes, I want you to write this down. So, I, last week, I talked to you about three quick things that temptation was, and I just want to re reference them real quick. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but just real quick to give us a foundation. This is not in your notes, but just something to remember. I told you letter A, that temptation never goes away, right? Temptation, say temptation never goes away. It never goes away. So we're, we, we are not going to, you cannot pray and say, God, I pray that I would have no temptation in my life. We will always have temptation in our life. As long as we are breathing, as long as we are, our heart is beating, we will always face temptation. Now, 
The Bible does say pray that we don't fall into temptation. What does that mean? That means that when temptation comes, my prayer is God, not that it will never come to me, but when it comes to me, that I wouldn't be led by my emotion, wouldn't be led by my feelings, but I would overcome the temptation when it does come. It's not if it comes, when it comes. Somebody say amen. Right? And so we need to understand that. That temptation gives us that. I also told you last week that temptation is not a sin. So just because you're tempted doesn't mean that it's a sin. Okay? So don't beat yourself up like, oh my God, I can't believe that I have these temptations. I am such a wicked person. No. We all battle temptation. Temptation is not a sin. What you do with the temptation determines whether it's a sin. So when you're tempted, you feel that temptation, but you reject it, five fingers to the face, straight arm to the head, right? And you push away from it. You, you didn't sin. You actually overcame it. And I remember I told you this, that temptation is not an opportunity to do wrong temptation is an opportunity to do right that when I am confronted with temptation it's my opportunity to put on display the integrity the goodness of God I have an opportunity to show the world that the God that I serve isn't just on Sunday morning but I serve him in every moment of my life somebody say amen and so we're going to view temptation different. That when I'm tempted, here's my opportunity to show that God is good. To do right. I also told you is that temptation is, uh, does not come from God. It's important, okay? Temptation does not come from God. Tell your neighbor, temptation does not come from God. Please tell him. I just want to warn you, my services are interactive. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to let you put it on autopilot, right? Let me check the World Cup score. No, no. It's interactive, okay? So we're having a conversation, me and you, and we're going to go on this ride together. Uh, temptation does not come from God, okay? And so this is important because there's a lot of people that, that come up with these weird theologies and weird uh, idealisms where they'll begin to think, well, this must be from God. If God didn't want me to leave my wife, he would have never let me meet somebody. Not from God, okay? All right, and so they start thinking that this must be from God. No, that's not from God. Or, man, if God didn't want me to smoke this, then he would have never given it to me. You know what I mean? Not from, okay, not from God. Temptation does not come from God. Temptation is from the enemy, okay? We need to understand that, that when I am tempted, this is trying to derail me and, and distract me from my destiny in Jesus Christ. Somebody say, ain't nobody got time for temptation, okay? Let's go ahead and tell them that. Ain't nobody. Tell your neighbor. We don't got no time for that. Just tell them we got no time for that, all right? Cool. We got a foundation. Here we go. Jesus was tempted, but let's start with this big question today. I always like tension in the text because tension allows us, when we read something, it's kind of like, yeah, why did that happen? It leads us to revelation. Tension takes us to revelation. Why was Jesus tempted? You ever thought about that? I mean, let's just, why be tempted? Why was Jesus hap even tempted? Did he have to, sh did he want to show us or did he want to show Satan how strong he was? Like, let me show you, Satan, how strong I am. So let me show the scriptures how I overcome temptation. Answer that question, no. Satan already knew how strong God was because when Satan tried to step up to God, he got kicked out of heaven. And the Bible says, I saw Satan fall like lightning and he couldn't stand up to God because God is all powerful. Somebody say amen. So why was Jesus tempted? I want you to write this in. This is in your notes. Letter A, Jesus was tempted to show us that we can overcome temptation. This is good. He was tempted to show us that we can overcome temptation. This is very, 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 very important. Tell your neighbor, say this is for you. Okay. This is super important because Jesus was tempted to show us that we can overcome temptation. When Jesus was confronted with a temptation, follow me here, okay? Don't lose me. Don't lose me. Don't lose me. When he was tempted, Jesus overcame temptation like a man would overcome temptation. He did not overcome temptation like God would overcome temptation. Let me make sense of this, okay? When temptation came to him, Jesus, right, we know that the divinity, he was fully God and fully man. He didn't say, Satan, you go to hell. Angels from heaven, come down and kick him out of earth. He didn't defeat him like God. He defeated him as a man would. Jesus, when confronted with temptation, said, it is written, thou shalt not live, I shall live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. In other words, Satan, I am going to defeat you and show all of my followers how they can defeat Satan 
Satan by using the word of God. And come on, somebody, right? And not to be afraid of the temptations of the enemy. Somebody clap like you know you can defeat temptation in Jesus' name. This is huge. This is huge. Because, see, when we think of temptation, well, I'm not, I mean, I'm not Jesus. How in the world can I overcome that temptation? Yes, you can, because we have the same authority that Jesus has. Let her be right to sin. Also, why was Jesus tempted? To show us how to overcome temptation. So he was tempted not only to show us that we can, but to show us how to overcome temptation. You know, something that I love is the how-to is to know the how-to, right? I mean, there's one thing to know why, but it's always good to know the how, which is, well, how do I overcome temptation? Jesus came to show us how to overcome temptation. Someone say how, right? And so he showed us that and be able to overcome that. Now, as we endeavor to look at the first temptation of Jesus, I, I think it's important, just a little side note, to know that the first temptation in the Bible had to do with the fruit. Remember Eve ate the fruit? I remember that story, right? And so Eve ate the fruit. That was the first temptation. The first temptation that Jesus was tempted with was with bread. Now, just a little side note, but the first temptation had to do with food. And that's why it leads me to believe that that chocolate cake that always calls my name is the devil. Come on, somebody. No, I'm just joking. Right? That's not angel food cake. That is devil food cake. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm joking. Don't be cursing your food when you get home. But, you know, uh, it's, just, it's just funny. But anyhow, the first temptation had to do with a physical want is the point. It had to do with something physically, something to, to try to, to satisfy the physical appetite. And this is important because, see, Satan is going to try to do the same thing to you, but we are not going to be any fools. We are going to be wise, in the, as the Bible says. We showed up to church, and we're not going to let, let the enemy come on, run around us in circles, but we're going to overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Somebody say amen to that. Now, here's the first temptation. I want you to write this in. Because... You might say, well, what, okay, what's up with the bread? I mean, is it wrong to eat bread? No, it's not wrong to eat bread. You know, I mean, it's just bread. Go ahead, right? Go ahead and eat bread. That rhymes. Hashtag go ahead. Anyhow, so no, point number one, the first temptation of Jesus was to satisfy a permitted need in an unpermitted way. So good. Because, again, it wasn't wrong to eat bread, but Satan shows up to Jesus after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and he says, the tempter said, if you're the son of God, in verse 3, he says, tell these stones to become bread. Is it wrong to eat bread? No, of course you can eat bread. So don't be like, we can't eat bread. No, no, go ahead. Right? But is it, is it okay to turn stones into bread? No. Now, it's not because Jesus couldn't. He's God. But remember, he was overcoming this temptation as a man would, not as God would. And so... We can't turn stones into bread. So when Satan said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread, he was tempting Jesus. He had a physical hunger, but he was tempting him to fulfill that hunger in an unpermitted way. Does that make sense? And that is the same thing that Satan does to this day to all of us as people. Pay close attention because this is going to set some people free and we're going to know when the devil's trying to mess with us. Is he will attempt to get you and I to fulfill a permitted need in an unpermitted way. Come on somebody, right? And so the Bible tells us this in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. It says, in order that Satan might not outwit us for we are not unaware what does it say here of his schemes this word schemes in the greek is noema can you say that with me noema right and so this word noema literally means mental perceptions in other words satan I'm sorry, Paul is saying we need to be wise. We need to know what this joker is up to so that we are not unaware of his little head games. Come on, somebody, right? We're not, we are aware of how he likes to mess with us and try to tempt us. And we're, we're aware, what's your, little, what's your little, little game, Satan, because he has the same couple of tricks, just different people. But you came to Freedom House this morning, and you're going to live in freedom because you're going to know this little, this little pony tricks that he tries to pull on us in Jesus' name. So he comes to Jesus says, Jesus, fulfill your hunger in an unpermitted way. And so to this day, he does the same thing to, to people. He tries to get us to pro fulfill a permitted need in an unpermitted way. For example, can I give you some examples? Is it permitted to be happy? Yeah, right? I mean, 
it's okay to be happy. And I, this might be a revelation, but it's okay to be happy in church. <laughs> it is. Just smile at your neighbor. Just smile at him. Because I'm happy, come along. Give, right? I, this might be a revelation. It's okay to be happy in church, right? God wants you to be happy. Contrary to popular belief, God is not just this old, grumpy, mad person in heaven. He's like, don't bug me. No, no, God loves you. He wants you to be happy, right? So just the word bless actually means to be happy, but not happenstance, but to have the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So to be happy is permitted. That's why every person has this desire. I mean, nobody wakes up and says, I hope today just, just stinks. Right? No, we all, man, today, I want to be happy. I want, we all have this natural desire that America calls it the pursuit of happiness. But we have this, this pursuit of wanting to have joy. But what Satan does is he tries to get you to fulfill that permitted need in an unpermitted way. So is it, is it okay to want to be happy? Yes. Is it okay to do your will over God's will to be happy? No. So what does Satan do? You deserve to be happy. Yes, I do. You ought to just do whatever you want. You're right. Wrong. So he gets you to try to fulfill a permitted need in an unpermitted way. Somebody say amen. And so that turns into selfishness. It turns into pride. And so I'm going to do what I want to do because I deserve to be happy. I want to be happy. So you know what? I'm, I'm going to do. And so we then turn that into an unpermitted way. And it leads us into uh, bondage or into uh, burdens and things over our lives. Here's another one for you. This one's fun. Is it okay to have fun? Yes. That was not a convincing yes. Some of you guys are not sure if it's okay to have fun. Is it okay to have fun? <laughs> yes. Okay. Absolutely. Right? Tickle your neighbor. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Okay. Really awkward if you don't know them. Uh, don't do that, please. You're like, I was waiting for that pastor. I don't, no, 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 no. Chill out. So is it okay to have fun? Absolutely. God's God, matter of fact, when God created the heavens and the earth, he put Adam and Eve in the garden and he's like, be fruitful and multiply. He's like, it's yours. Go ahead and play with Simba, Baloo, Abu. I mean, it's it's all go. I mean, it's just him and his girl. Come on, me and my girlfriend. Right? I mean, it's Adam and Eve and they're just hanging. I mean, they're having a good time. God says, have fun. God wasn't like, don't have fun and stay right here. And so, but we, we let the world paint this view of God that's untrue. God's like, have fun. So is it okay to have fun? Yes. yes. Is it okay to have fun and just party all weekend and what happens in Vegas stays on Facebook, Twitter? And... <laughs> I am preaching. Somebody say, right? No. Permit it need to fulfill it in an unpermitted way. He's doing that to this day. You deserve it, right? Just get faded. Forget all the worries. Yeah, let's just have fun. And just, you know, we popping bottles, man, all night. You know. <laughs> Somebody say amen like the pastor's preaching the truth this morning. Come on, man, right? <laughs> Unpermitted. What does the Bible say, right? A drunkard shall now enter the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm preaching. Now listen, don't kill the messenger, read the word. The Bible says that a drunkard will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's clear as day. Well, I'm not drunk, I'm just a little buzzed. Hey, listen, if you want to play with eternity, but the Bible says will not enter heaven, that's serious stuff. It's clear. But I just want to have fun, permit it. In a, un well, it just kind of takes the edge off and makes me real, it just, it just relaxes me. Can I tell you something? You don't need the king of beers to relax. You can go to the king of kings and the lord of law. Come on, somebody, help me preach this morning. And he will take away your anxiety, your worries, your stress. Come on, your burdens, your hurts. Somebody ought to clap. Let me get some mamas clapping up in this place right now in Jesus' name. Right? Fun. Permit it unpermitted way. Oh, I just want to have fun. Let's just blaze it up. Right? Unpermitted. Well, if God didn't want it, why did he put the plants for me to enjoy? <laughs> he, I've heard it all. You got to be, I'm telling you, I've heard it all, but I heard a lot, right? If God didn't want me, why did he put plants there? I just, yeah, no. Unpermitted. You've never been high until you met the most high. Somebody say amen, because I got these for days if you don't get it. All right, so I want to have fun, so I'm not going to go to church on Sunday. Man, you have not been to Freedom House if you don't think church is fun. Come on, somebody. We got kids water. We got dunk tank. We got all kinds of stuff. All right? This is serious stuff. Now, this next subject I'm going to talk about is something that the church has failed to address very clearly because it's a big thing. Churches are sometimes scared to talk about this, but not us. We keep it real. 
sexual temptations, sexual desires. Did, is it okay to have sexual desire? Yes. Now, before you say no, it's the devil. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. God created you with sexual desires. Okay? He made you that way. Sexual desires did not start in Hollywood. They started in heaven. God created sex. Okay? Don't worry. I'm going to keep it above water. Parents are my kids. But, okay. But, you know, if we can have a mature conversation, you know, we'll have giggles plus stuff. But, but God created it. It wasn't some idea Satan came up with. God said, I made a man and a woman to have a sexual desire that the man and the woman would become one and they would have an intimacy, a blessing, and an enjoyment that they would be fruitful and multiply. But what Satan does is try to get you to fulfill a permitted need in an unpermitted way and hook up before marriage, hook up outside of marriage, try to be the player. Come on, somebody. But that is not the way God intended. God made it, come on, to be with the husband and a wife. I wish some mamas would clap, some dads would clap, and some people that believe God's word was true would clap in Jesus' name. God says, I know I made you that way, but within marriage. Now, you, people of all ages, you got to hear me on this, because our culture tries to say, well, hey, I mean, just have fun. I mean, you know, you know what, what is that piece of paper anyway? No, it's not a piece of paper. It's a covenant that the two shall become one that I will not be sexually intimate with somebody who is not my spouse, but that is reserved for my spouse. Young people, listen to me. Don't sell yourself short. You need a man who is going to cover you, not try to get you under the cover. Somebody say amen. But someone who's going to respect you and honor you. I wish somebody helped me right now, right? You need someone who's going to lead you closer to God, not closer to his bedroom. You need someone who's going to take you to come on somebody, right? Into a place of the word, not to the place of the world. World. A man of God. If you're, if you're dating, it's a great way to know if he has integrity. Because if he has integrity when you're dating, he'll have integrity when you're married. I am preaching good right now. Somebody say amen. Right? Well, you know, no. Because if you think that lust stops when you get married, you are fooled. You still got to fight it. And if you're not fighting it as singles, what makes you think they're going to defeat it as married? I am preaching, right? But they're barriers. Sexual temptation is big. What does the Bible say about it? Not Pastor Josiah, but the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Can I preach it like I want to? Okay. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Let's let the Word talk to us. Someone say the Bible's going to talk to us, all right? Is it on the screens? Okay. You're like, I don't know because I'm not looking. No, look. Come on, somebody, right? <laughs> I didn't hear that. Look, yes, you did. It says, run from what? Sexual sin. It's saying run from it. Like, just run. Why? Because he said, no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality, which is sex outside of marriage, before marriage, or breaking, some, you know, in marriage, adultery. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. This is deep. Meaning God's like, it's not so much that you're sinning against me. He's like, you're sinning against your own body. This is just, you, are, you are pure. You don't have soul ties with people. Honor your body. Honor who you are. Now, if you failed in the past, I'm not here to beat you up. You came to Freedom House. I'm here to build you up. That's the past. I'm talking about the future. That today you can say, from this day forward, God, I'm going to honor your word. I'm going to honor my body. And I'm going to wait for the one I'm going to be married to. Somebody give God a hand clap in Jesus' name. Well, you know, I'm not sure if I'd marry them. Well, then why are you messing around potentially making them your baby mama? Come on, somebody. I'll leave that one alone. I'll move on, okay? <laughs> Providing. Is providing permitted? Yes. Not a trick question. You know, earning income, is that, is, that, is that a permitted need? Yes, right? So watch how the Satan does this. But is trying to follow money and forsaking everything else unpermitted? So he says, you know, well, look, man, you got to make money. You got to provide for your family. And they're all legitimate. 
But unpermitted, people then start forsaking God. They become greedy. They don't, you know, they're working hours. They lose their family. They lose their kids, all for the sake of making the dollar dollar bills, y'all, right? Trying to make the money, and they lose everything. He takes a permitted need, gets you to fulfill it in an unpermitted way, and you find yourself down a road you never wanted to go down. Amen. I can keep going. Is laughing permitted? Yes. At people's failures and faults? Unpermitted. Talking, permitted, gossiping, backbiting, negative. Uh, come on, somebody, right? Tell your neighbor, we got this one. Okay, I'll move on. If you got it, I'll move on. You got it? Okay, great. The devil works overtime to take permitted needs and get us to satisfy it in unpermitted ways. But you came to Freedom House. You know the devil's schemes. You're going to know what the word says. Say, I ain't going down that road. Point number two, write this in. Jesus, right, in the first temptation, he overcame the first temptation by what he lived on. What he lived on, what was his nourishment, is how he overcame it. Excuse me. On Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, watch what the Bible says. Jesus answered, right? And he told Satan, when Satan said, turn the stones into bread, Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but what? On every word that comes from the mouth of the media. No. What comes out of the mouth of my, you know, uh, 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 my, my comadre? No. What comes out of the mouth of my homies? What comes out of the mouth of my coworkers? What comes out of the mouth of, of, of magazines? No. What comes out of the mouth of God? In other words, Jesus said, Satan, you are trying to get me to fulfill a permitted need in an unpermitted way. But what I got for you is I don't got for you just to know. I got for you what the Bible says, that I do not live on bread alone. or I don't live on things in this earth to fulfill me. I live by God's word. Word, what heaven says and heaven's word fulfills my life and I will fulfill my permitted need in a permitted way which will then therefore get me to a place of freedom legacy and blessing fruitfulness and multiplying somebody say amen and so Jesus says it is written in other words for us to overcome temptation we've got to get some it is written in our vocabulary do you have some it is written in your vocabulary if you have your, your notes, underline the words, it is written, right there. It is written. Do you have it is written in your vocabulary? Meaning, when you are presented with a temptation, what did Jesus write about that? Or it's like, you know, I'm not really sure what God says about that. And there, that's when it overcomes. Now, I, I want to really bring this to our attention here, is that Jesus did not say no. Notice this. Because when the temptation came to him, he wasn't like, no. That's it. Sometimes we put a lot of bank on a no. Well, I'll just say no. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus used it is written. Why? Because sometimes our no's are not powerful enough. Because some of you, you said no all the way to it. No, stop. No, 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 no. A little too real? I, I, am, I, am I too? No, 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 no. Or, no, I really shouldn't. No, man, you know what? No, 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 no. All right, why not? You said no all the way to it. But in order for you to de defeat levels of temptation, for people that understand there's a destiny on their life, a call on their life, a purpose on their life, the no is not going to be enough. You have got to get some, it is written in your spirit. So when that temptation comes, you say, no, it is written, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto me. When something else comes, you say, no, thou shall not lie, thou shall not steal. You're going to say, no, I shall honor my father. I shall honor my marriage. I wish somebody believed in God's word and gave God a clap like God's word works in Jesus name. <laughs> to overcome temptation, we need to have a personal revelation of God's word because every temptation, if you want to write this in your notes to get the full experience of Freedom House, trust me, take notes, take notes, write stuff down. It'll just, it'll enhance. You know, they say that if you just listen, you'll remember about 5% of what you heard. But if you take notes, it goes up to 20 to 30% of what you heard. Yeah. And so when you write it down, you're actually now visualizing what you're writing down. You're writing it down. And so I'm just, I want to encourage you, okay? If you can, believe me, be a student of God's word. But every temptation is a direct attack on your faith in God's word. Every temptation is a direct attack in your faith or on your faith in God's word. Every temptation. It's an attack to try to get you to say, this is not true. The 
the cultural view is true. And I'll prove it to you in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 3, if you get that Scripture up there for me, media team. The first time Satan shows up to the Scripture to tempt Eve, he said to the woman, watch this now. He said, did God, what did it say there? Really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. So let me act it out for you because I always like to give us a visual picture. I like to jump in. What's going on right here? Okay. So Satan shows up, right? He's a snake, which he always slivers his way through there. You're right? Snakes have the ability to go through small cracks. That's why you got to watch the cracks in your, in your life. Slithers in there. And he says, did God really say that? Like, did he really say that? I could picture him going, you know, I'm not sure if he really said that. You know, I'm not, did he say that? Is that what Pastor said on Sunday? I don't even remember. Is that what I read? You know, I'm not sure. In other words, her inability to know exactly what God said gave Satan an advantage over her life. Our inability to know what God says gives Satan an advantage over our lives. When I know what God said, I say, devil, I don't have to know all your little tricks, but if I know the truth, I'll know a lie when it comes because the truth shall set me free. Somebody give God a clap like you're free in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, I better move on. I got to move quick here. Come on, somebody. Say amen. All right. Stones into bread were a shortcut. Don't ever take the shortcut, guys. Now, I know this, this is very practical right here. I'm going to go as practical as possible. But stones into bread, when Satan goes, turn the stone into bread, in other words, it was a shortcut. He was basically telling Jesus, don't go cook the bread. Don't go buy the bread. Don't go fix up the bread. Don't go get the bread. Just turn the bread from stones to bread. And that's what he tells us. He tries to look for us to get the shortcut. Just don't, 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 don't waste your time. I mean, hey, come on, right? You want to feel, you're, if the fastest way is not always the best way, right? Steak, how many of those steaks take time? I mean, if you want a hot pocket, bing, hot pocket. But you know, enjoy your hot pocket of life. But if you want a ribeye steak, come on, somebody, right? With, with some black pepper cooked in some butter, you know, kind of medium in the middle, a little sear on the top and the bottom. Some of you are getting hungry, but I know, right? And just a good, some sasson on there. You know, it's just a good steak. You know, it's going to take a little time. You can be like, hey, chef, can you just bring it out in a minute? He'd be like, hey, chill out, bro. Chill out. It's going to take a little time if you want a good steak. And I come to tell somebody that God has steaks prepared for you in life. Don't settle for the hot pocket and the shortcut way. <laughs> Amen. Don't settle for the shortcut way, right? I just want to be in love. So I just settle for Papi Chulo. Come on. I don't want to wait. He kind of loves God. I mean, he, 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 he like almost said a scripture one time. <laughs> Come on, somebody, right? Well, you know, I just, I, I just, I'll just try to change her. I'll just try to change him. Many have tried. Many have end up in my office for counseling. Come on, somebody. No, I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> Lord Jesus, help us. I want to be happy so you party your college years away. I want to be rich so you do unethical things. You become greedy. Remember this. Let me say this to you as a father would tell a child. Maybe you don't have a father in your life. Do things right, and you'll be blessed. Do things right, and you'll be blessed. Don't go the shortcut. It may be tempting to do the shortcut, but do things right, and you will be blessed. You'll be fulfilled, and you'll thank yourself later. Proverbs 10.4, lazy hands make poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. The shortcut is always the lazy way. Ah, I don't want to go through all that. I'll just <laughs> but in the long term, you end up paying more for it. Amen. Good preaching. Come on, somebody. Last one, and I'm done. Third point. There's always more at risk than what you think. There's always more at risk than what you think. Matthew 4, 2 through 3, the Bible says the tempter came to him, and he said, turn the stones into bread. I said it earlier today at the beginning of the message, and we'll end where we started. Do you think it was just about bread? No, guys, no, no. 
He wasn't about bread. It wasn't about, the whole story is not about a piece of pan dulce. You know? No, I said no to the pan dulce. Yay! You know, no, no, no. There was so much more at stake in this temptation. If Jesus gave in to the pan dulce, it would be him giving in to the temptation of Satan, which would then grow into something bigger and end up killing the destiny, the salvation of humanity, because there was a call of God on Jesus' life. And I come to tell somebody that the temptation that's in front of you is not about that little thing, but it's about what's in your life. The, you know, the Pharaoh didn't want to kill Moses just because of Moses, but Moses represented the deliverance of the nation of Israel. Jesus was not trying to be killed by Herod just because of Jesus, but because Jesus would bring salvation to the world. And I come to tell you that the temptations in front of you is not just about you, but it's what's coming through you. The kids that you're raising, the nation that you live in, the marriage that you're in, the person that you are, the call that you have, the destiny that's in front of you, the people you're going to reach, there is a call of God on your life, and what's in front of you is bigger than what we think. Somebody say amen. Well... It's just a little thing. Ah, it's just a little, little, little thing. I mean, nobody, it's not going to hurt nobody. Write this down in your notes if you can. Magnify the consequence. Magnify the consequence. i got to wrap this up. Magnify the consequence. You know, sometimes we always want to minimize the consequence, right? Our natural human tendency is to minimize it. Eh, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't really matter. But that's not what we tell our kids. How many parents do we have in here? Come on, somebody. You brought him to the water, water world. Good. Um, when we see our little attitude in our kids, what do we do to our kids? Hey, we correct it, right? Why do we correct it? It's just a little attitude. You'd be like, no, 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 no. He gave me a little attitude. I got to correct that because he might go to school and give his teacher attitude. And then when he gets older, he may give a police officer attitude. And then that's not going to be good. And then if he gets older, he might give his, his, uh, his boss attitude. And he's going to be unemployed and come back and leave with me. And that ain't going to happen. So I better correct this. Right? And you correct it because you're like, I know how big that problem can get. That's all we have to do with temptation. This little thing, I got to correct it because, see, this can turn to that, that can turn to that, that can turn to that. And it goes into this thing. I need to maximize it. I need to magnify it so that I can get it while it's still as a little root and not minimize it and let it become this big old thing that later will end up killing my destiny. The Bible puts it like this in James chapter 1, verse 15, or 14. It says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to what? Sinful actions. And when sin is, what does it say here? Allowed. What you allow, you authorize. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to what? Death. Death. When sin is allowed. Tell your neighbor, say, don't allow it. Don't allow it in your life. Don't allow it when it's allowed. What we allow, we authorize. If you allow to be disrespected, then you authorize disrespect. If you allow addictions, then you authorize addictions. What you allow, you authorize. He says, don't let it because it's going to bring death. Now, death is in two forms here. The scripture is speaking about physical death and also spiritual death because some of our habits not only will bring death in the sense of death to things, but death to our life. I'm reminded of a story when Freedom House first started, and I won't use names to protect the identities, but I remember when Freedom House had started, there was a certain couple that started coming, and um, you know, this, this guy, man, I would talk to him, I'd talk to him, talk to him, talk to him, and I remember just pleading with him, please, let go of this habit, let go of it, let go of it. Don't let it. They, 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 were, they, they stood on my house, they, I, mean, we, I mean, I'd pray with them, and I'd talk to him, let go of this habit. And no matter what, they, they couldn't. I mean, oh, I'm going to try all this stuff. And later on, I, I, I get, you know, a, a, a call. Hey, so-and-so, they died. They were so intoxicated that the apartment caught fire and they died in it. And I remember I was just heartbroken. Like, are you kidding me? That, that is like young person. But this thing literally killed them. Now, I want to say this to this room because... I don't know what it is that you may think is just a little thing, but it may kill you. And I'm not trying to put fear into you like, el, you know, el cucuy gonna get you. That's not what I mean. But what I do mean is it will cut your life short. 
And I know most people have this plan like, well, you know, I mean, right now I'm just kind of doing, I know, I know, got my little things, but when I get older, then I'll just kind of let all this stuff go. You know, that's a great plan if you're going to live to be older. But the Bible never promised us a single day. You don't know. Life is but a vapor. Here, one second, gone the next. Has life gone by fast? Uh huh, yeah, like that. Physical death, maybe even spiritual death. Death to what? Your marriage, death to your family. Be a deadbeat father, a deadbeat mother. Friendships die, careers die. They say, man, we really would love to promote you, but just this thing that you have is just so inconsistent. We can't really put you in a management position. Death, when it's allowed. You see, mishandled temptation always leads to death. You can write that down. And I really got to pray here. This is my fourth closing, sorry. Mishandled temptation leads to death. And I have to share this story because I hope that it would relate to you. Mishandled temptation leads to death. I can only share with you my experiences because this is what I know. And if you can relate, I pray that you can. But my father mishandled his temptations. My father had temptations of alcoholism, drug addiction, gambling, womanizing. And he mishandled his temptations. He was an absent father. And at age 10, he left my mom and my five brothers and just split the scene. Now, the crazy thing is, though, if you can go back 20 years, and I don't want to paint this terrible picture of my dad, but God's restoring our relationship, you know, little by little, 20 years later. But there still was a lot of damage. But if you would have talked to my dad 20 years ago and asked him, hey, is everything okay? He would have swore by everything holy, I got everything under control. It's all good. It's okay. It's fine. But things weren't fine. And I remember so many years, I... I was hurt because I felt like he walked out on us. Man, how could my dad walk out on us? He walked out on my brothers, walk out on my mom, walk out of our lives. And I, I had all this hurt until God showed me through his word and I matured in the word of God and matured in my spirituality and my perspective of things. God showed me that the truth is he didn't walk out on us, but somewhere down the line, he walked out on himself. He gave up. He stopped fighting temptation and just decided, I'm just going to do it. And somewhere down the line, he realized that no longer was he going to fight those temptations, but he was just going to do it. And when God showed me that, it set me free because then I started having compassion for him because I realized that he never, before he ever walked out on us, he walked out on himself. And I believe there's some people in this room that the truth is, is that you haven't walked out on people as you walked out on yourself. Why would a person abuse themselves? Why would a person walk out on their family? Why would a person live in depression? It's not because they're walking out on people. It's they walked out on themselves. Then they don't believe that God has a call on their life and a purpose for their life and a destiny for their life lives. Somebody say amen. And the Bible says this. It says Jesus replied in Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, but he said, and the second is equally as important. He said, love your neighbor. What does it say here? As yourself. I want you to notice here. He said, love your neighbor like how? Notice it didn't say love your neighbor like you love God. He said, love your neighbor like you love who? Why would it say that? Because see, you will never love those most important to you till you value your own self. <laughs> and so you can look in the mirror and say, there's a purpose on your life, man. There's, there's destiny. And I can't let you settle for nothing but God's best. And I can't let you, and you got to look in the mirror and say, I can't let you fulfill permitted needs unpermitted ways I can't let you give into that temptation because there's God call on your life and when you can value yourself then you'll value other people or else you won't you'll give up on yourself ah whatever who cares no value what God put in your life the best gift you can give your children ask me what is it the best you the best gift you can give your spouse, ask me, what is it? The best you. But if we're giving our kids a unforgiven us, broken us, addicted us, mad us, a, you know, a, 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 just all broken us, 
so you don't love yourself. Learn to love. Now, I'm not talking about loving yourself all self-absorbed. Let me post a selfie and like my own picture. That's not what I'm talking about. Man, that's a good selfie, right? I mean, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about value. Valuing who you are and what God wants to do in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a hand clap. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Hey there, Pastor Josiah Silva here. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. I really pray that it spoke to you and encouraged you to get further along in your walk with Christ. Hey, I'm so thankful for technology and the way we're able to stay connected through all sorts of media outlets. You know, if you're watching this online through your iPhone or your iPad or on a computer or some tablet, you know, it's amazing how we can just be able to bring to you the gospel and be able to spread this message of hope with you and encourage you. Hey, if this message again spoke to you, there are two things I want you to do. Number one is begin to seek God. Ask God, how does he want you to grow through this? How does he want you to respond and be able to go further in your walk with Christ? And the second thing is share this with somebody. Maybe you know somebody who can maybe use this encouragement or this message. You know, share, you being able to share that can speak to somebody you have no idea who may be seeking for answers and God can touch their heart. Hey, also, if you're listening to this and maybe uh, you don't find your, you'll find yourself not at the place you should be with Christ. Listen, God can give you a fresh start, a new beginning, and a new life in Him. I want you to say this prayer with me if you want to experience that new life and get close to God. Say this, say, Jesus, I confess you as Lord. Come into my heart and change my life. If you said that short prayer, hey, I believe that's going to set off something where you're going to be able to then begin get closer to God. Hey, we'd love to meet you in person. I'm thankful for the media outlets that we have, but I'd love for you to come to one of our services, whether it be on a Sunday, we have three service times at 8.30, 10.30, and 12.30, as well as a midweek campus on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Love to meet you in person and have you come worship with us at one of our services. Hey, once again, thank you for, uh, for watching this, and if God leads you, we'd love to meet you here in person. God bless you. Talk soon.